white. Nothing unusual there. His opponent in the semi-mirror, though, is playing a blue-white deck with a splash, but this time it's a little something different. What's Jared Porter got in, uh, to, to mix up the blue-white formula? He has a couple green lands and Kiora the Crashing Wave. Very powerful new Planeswalker. We've seen Chris Finnell uh, two weeks ago in Atlanta try to incorporate that into a green devotion strategy. You see it here in a band shell. Breeding Pool, not the most popular dual land in standard of the last couple months, but Kiora potentially giving it some legs to come back. Yeah, but as we see here, Breeding Pool still not the most popular dual land. A whole lot more <laughs> Temple of Mystery, Temple of Plenty, you know, Temple of Enlightenment, even Temple Garden. <laughs> so you see both players here just starting off with some land drops, and uh, that's the most critical thing early on is just the first player to miss a land drop is the first person who often has to act. I love this, by the way. Ten temples playing with ten scry lands and just six shock lands. It's about time people recognize. Definitely a statement on how slow the format is right now. Oh, yeah. Now, you're Jesse. What do you make of this? You know, when he plays Hallowed Fountain Island, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to settle into this nice control match, whatever. And then he drops a green land on turn three. I think Kiora will come to my mind. Kiora is a very powerful planeswalker. I also really like it alongside Jace, as Jace is really good against a lot of little things where Kiora struggles. Jace is not very good against one big thing, which is where Kiora is, is quite powerful. And so we got a reader. They're a nice tandem there as you see Kiora enter play. And Jerry going to go straight for the explore text here. Plays a Hallow Fountain. Chase Architect the Thought, the play from Jesse. Now, who do you think has the edge in this? Both players are getting to use their Planeswalker. Both players immediately drawing cards. Who wins the head-to-head? -head? I actually think Kiora might be slightly favored. Kiora gets to its ultimate much faster. And the mana advantage you can provide if, you're, if your hand is situated the right way is a real thing, too. Well, and if you just want to draw cards, Kiora can draw a card... Uh, every turn and stop the Jace. Yeah. I mean, that's like, I think that Kiora's ability to just literally paralyze Jace, you know, like, kind of demands an answer. Oh, wow. And Elspeth, too? What El it, this is like sliding heavily in Jared's favor. Yeah, Elspeth ahead of schedule thanks to Kiora's explore here. I mean, this is, Kiora's just doing everything. She, I mean, he, she, he, she, he drew her, or she drew him an extra card, got him Elspeth down a turn earlier, and is making it so that Jesse can't dig any harder. He can't, and he can't plus his Jace in order to stop the Elspeth tokens from getting in there. This is just, I mean, this is everything going exactly what, the way the Bant deck wrote it up in the playbook. So Jesse now debating between playing the Detention Sphere in his hand or his Elspeth. It's interesting, he's got such an, uh, an abundance of options, but he's just getting tempoed out by that, uh, by, the, uh, by the Explorer. And you rarely see this, this come up in Esper or Blue-White Mirrors, but Kiora is adding a, a very new dimension to the gameplay. Yeah, this is definitely a lot different than the way that it would be against Blue-White or, or Esper. And Jesse's like, wow, you have, Espe you have Elspeth, all these tokens, I still need to kill Kiora. She's the biggest threat right now. Oh, okay, then he hits the Elspeth also. So two detention spheres here for Jesse, taking care of Jared's Planeswalkers. And we're seeing a lot of tapping out thus far in the match. This is uh, definitely unconventional gameplay thus far. Yeah, it looks like the Jedi mind trick worked on us. The uh, Kiora hitting the Jace. Yep. But Jesse not falling for it. Detention sphere here takes care of Jace. Temple Garden from Jared and passes the turn with Dissolve in hand and the mana to cast it. And a slight edge on board. Jesse just plays the land and says go. And three damage coming across. And Jared's simply happy to sit on his hands right now. Revelations and a turn for Jesse. 
So now, is this a turning point? I mean, he's stuck at Revelations. He's actually got something going now. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. I, I've watched a lot of Blue White and Esper sort of control matchups, and landing the first Revelation isn't necessarily game over because both decks have so many weak or inefficient draws that it's not the overwhelming source of card advantage that it is in a lot of other places. You know, your Detention Spheres, your Azorius Charms, there's like a lot of dead pieces. And so Revelation, where for three or four against it's a good. deck like Green Red Monsters is often lights out. In the Control Mirror matches, I see players resolve big Revelations all the time and still lose uh, just because a lot of the text boxes don't matter. Sure, makes sense. The dissolves are, and the counter, the hard counters are actually, in a lot of places, the more important pieces. Wow, this is big. Jerry just top decked the Sphinx's Revelation. That's huge. That's exactly what he needed to do. His Elspeth tokens are being held off right now by that Muta Vault. But he's going to oh. fire in. He's not afraid of nothing. And Jesse is not willing to risk his Muta Vault dying, and so... He will attempt to resolve another big revelation at the end of the turn, and Jared will fight over this with Dissolve. Makes sense. Jesse untaps. Pretty stocked hand right now. Yeah, I mean, he, he has successfully uh, talked to the Sphinx. Not a dominating position yet, but he certainly has some good things going. Now, Jared is going to make a move as soon as he has a free turn and Sphinx himself, but Jesse will respond with his own Sphinx even bigger. And a really big thing for Jesse right now is the presence of Thoughtseize in his deck. He has two main deck. He's able to find that. He gets the information and to take the best card out of Jared's hand, and that's the reason why Asper often has favorable matchups against other control decks is the presence of Thoughtseize. Oh, yeah. The Elspeth tokens come across again for Jared. And another big end of turn revelations from Jesse. Now, what's interesting is if Jared Sphinx is right now, he's going to have to discard the hand size, whereas Jesse doesn't have that problem. However, if he waits till Jesse's turn, he's risking Jesse countering his Sphinx's revelation and locking the game up. Yep. And Jared says that's fine. He needs every card he can get, apparently. Yeah, so even though Jesse behind uh, on the board, it's not even particularly consequential because he's got the mana and card advantage. Right. And he's gained way, you know, far, you know, enough life that the, uh, the beatdown is not a real threat. So here's Thought Seeds from Jesse. And this is the big tool that Esper has here in these control mirrors. And Jared lays out a hand of two Sphinx's Revelations, a Detention Sphere, a Supreme Verdict, and a Last Breath. Yeah, I think this is going to be Curtains, as Jesse is, has the Dissolve for the other Sphinx's Revelation. And he's accumulated just such a huge resource oh, at yeah. this point. I mean, he's, at this point, Revelations for nine cards. You know, three and then six, that's, that's huge. And information in these matchups is also just so critical. Very much so. I love this. He's playing the Elspeth because he knows, first of all, the coast is clear. Second of all, he's still got Dissolve open. And he knows exactly the contents of Jared's hand. He can fight over the Revelation if if Jared wants to untap into Detention Sphere, this not the end of the world. You're yeah, just bleeding about resources. And it, you've got three tokens to block his three tokens. This No, this is just a great play. And here's that Revelations from Jared at the end of the turn, and that's going to be met with Dissolve. And Jesse has to discard down to seven. Oh, darn. Yep. <laughs> another interesting thing is uh, Jesse also has access to, to his Mutabolts here, which is another potent way to swing this game around. Both players have two, but Jesse is the one with them in play. Oh, yeah. Yep, just more ways to, uh, more axes to, to build uh, advantages on. 
It looks as though Jared has drawn Jace Architect of Thought this turn, which he's going to add to the board. Which is something. I mean, that's one of the better draws you could hope for in a spot like this. Flips over two Temple of Mysteries and a Jace. And Jared quickly, uh, Jesse rather quickly splits Lance and Spells. Jared takes the Jace. So that Jace giving Jared a little bit of hope here. But now we might see those Muta Vaults come into play. Yeah, I mean, Jesse's, Jesse wants to, to crush whatever counterplay Jared has. And the most obvious line is just attack with both Muta Vaults and the three tokens, leaving Jared with no blocks that actually save the Jace. Question is, is he greedy? Does he just Sphinx some more? I think you just want to remove the counterplay at this point. Yeah, I would just be focused on answering the board. The problem is, if he does that, he won't be able to play that Elspeth that's burning a hole in his head. Oh, no, he can do both because hey, he leaves himself it? tapped out. But again, he knows at this point the only thing he's going to really have to fight over on the way back is the Jace that, that Jared just found. Yep. A lot of complexity here in the what do I do on my turn? What's that going to cause Jared to respond with? What do I need to respond to in turn, etc. So. Even this that looks on the surface to be kind of a straightforward turn is actually quite complicated. Now, one possibility, you can attack with just one mutavolt if, uh, if you kill one of the tokens with a removal spell. And it looks like Jesse might be pursuing that course of action here. Problem is, how much more does that accomplish than just attacking with him? Okay. He is going to run it. I guess the removal spell is not doing a lot for him either. Yeah, and I think Jesse just wants to make sure that he removes Jace from the table this turn. So Mutaval and two tokens come across. We'll see if Jared wants to make any trades here. He's going to try to put his two tokens in front of the Mutaval. Jesse says that's okay, and Jace is down. Now another Elspeth from Jesse. Putting Jared on the gun to find an answer to all this very soon. This is curious. It's been a lot, much more proactive pace of play from these two control decks than we traditionally see. A oh, lot yeah. of tapping out. Oh, yeah. And it's not like they're short on counter spells. I mean, both players have uh, have six, at least six counter spells, but even despite this, they are, you know, at least, like, yeah, four dissolves, I guess four, four dissolves and a syncopate on one side, four dissolves and two syncopates on the other. Despite this, it's been a very Planeswalker-centric game. So Jared plays his Jace, minuses it, turns over three lands, which, of which he gets two. And now, plays a Supreme Verdict. And with that Muta Vault in play, Jesse's going to be able to answer the Jace. Yeah, once again, Jared's just, it always seems like he's one click behind, you know? One turn behind being able to Sphinx his Revelation, one turn behind being able to save his Planeswalkers. Muta Vault takes care of the Jace. Elspeth pluses again. Although Jesse has kind of flooded out here. A big rev off the top for Jared could crawl him back into this. Yeah, it's going to have to be relatively soon just because that Elspeth is threatening to win the game in short order. See Jesse cycle in his Aureus Charm and just play his land for the turn, passing it back. Now does Jesse, ha it looks like Jesse might have one more Sphinx's Revelation, right? It's very land heavy hand with Doomblade. I couldn't catch the last one. Yeah, card. it looked like it was like several land, a Doomblade, and a Sphinx's Revelation. And if it is, he is about to make a big play next turn. Another Chase Architect of Thought for Jared. And Jared going up. He wants to save his Jace, nurse the, th the only thing he has going. Yet another land for Jesse Hampton. 
Plus is Elspeth again. There's a tap Gala Shrine. It's a Supreme Verdict is the last card in hand. Oh, it is not Sphinx's Revelation. That's harsh. So he shield. is actually flooding out. So that shield. Jace is winning this head to head. Yeah. Shields are down right now. What a back and forth. Well, this is sort of what I meant about the, the revs earlier, you know. it's yeah. There's a lot of lands in these decks and a lot of dead draws. The the big revs are not necessarily game over. Definitely. Oh, oh wow. That was that was a game changer right there. And there's a <laughs> minus by Chase. Turns over Sphinx's Revelation. Jesse quick to set its own pile. Separated against Supreme Verdict and Temple of Enlightenment. See, I actually... I wonder, why don't you just put the... Maybe you put the Temple of Enlightenment with the Sphinx's Revelation. Because if he picks the Revelation, he's going to have all the land he could ever want. Now, the, the argument to split it this way is that uh, this way he's going to... You know, he won't get a land drop this turn unless he main phases the Sphinx. But it's probably one of those situations where there's not a ton you can really do anyway. Right. I think, you know, it's one of those things where... That's the best card. You're almost guaranteed to take it. I'm just going to put it by itself. Right, but remember, the more important thing is how can you actually win this game? Does the temple actually... Uh, how much does the temple increase the probability of him winning if he takes the Sphinx pile? How much does the temple increase the probability of him winning if he, if he somehow takes the verdict pile? Sure, no, that's, that's a very reasonable point. Seeing Jared... Very cautiously separate his mana here. It looks like he does want to rev with a Revan's good. And he's not just, he doesn't want to go full bore here, so he's... Because he wants to draw a Detention Sphere or a Supreme Verdict yeah. so that he can sweep the tokens and save his Jace. So we're going to see a, a small rev here. This is a modest three or four. It looks like he's found both Detention Sphere and Supreme Verdict, so he's found the answers he's looking for. Interesting. He decides to Detention Sphere and lose his Jace. This Jace feels very critical to me. Yeah, it feels like it's the best thing he had going on. Like, maybe you just Supreme Verdict and the next turn Detention Sphere. In any case, Jared leaving the shields down on Jace. And now Jesse fires up his Muta Vault and it's going to start attacking. Three at Jace and, and five at Jared. Should knock Jared down to 18 and take care of the Jace. Now Jared, again, very low on resources, draws a Kiora. Mm, that's pretty strong. In conjunction with that Supreme Verdict. Yeah, if he verdicts away the tokens and Kiora's Muta Vault. So Supreme Verdict does resolve. Now, Jared taps four more mana, adds Kiora. And pluses it on the Muta Vault. And just like the game's kind of swung back here in large part because of Jesse flooding out so much. Absolutely. And it's funny for Jesse to be hoping to draw a revelation at this point since he's already drawn so many. And it does not take Cure very long to get to ultimate. No. No, it definitely does not. Is that a was that a dissolve off the top for Jared? That's a huge draw too. Kira threatening to win the game effectively next turn. Oh. You know, or create at least an insurmountable board position. Jesse must answer Kira now, or he is going to have an awful lot of Leviathans to deal with. Or no. Krakens, or whatever the hell those guys are these days. I believe it's Krakens. Yeah. Correct. They are Krakens. And now we have a Kraken emblem. Yeah. I think it is pretty clear right now that Jesse has a serious, a serious Kraken problem. Oh. It's not impossible to outpace these with Supreme Verdicts and Detention Spheres, but it does put Jesse, obviously, under quite a bit of pressure. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just painful to see, though. It's 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 real tough. Like, and these Krakens are so large. Nine nine. Yeah, you're not getting nickel and dime. You're taking th these are nine a shot. Yeah, and it's tough because you try to deal with one, but it always seems like there's there's one more Kraken out there. Jesse plays another Temple, scries at the bottom, casts Supreme Verdict. Yeah, I mean, he's going to have to do something every turn. Not every turn, I guess. He can take one hit if he really needs to, but... And there's no stopping this. The Kraken problem is from here on out. Jesse fires up the Muta Ball and sends it in. Jared uses a last breath. Probably pretty thrilled to get to cash that in for anything at all. And now Jared will take a, a big untap here. <laughs> Kiora emblem in play. A couple counter spells. Oof, he's got this one locked up pretty nicely. Another Kiora could possibly generate a second emblem. Whatever it takes. We would be charting new territory, I feel like, if the game got to that place. And that's going to prompt a dissolve from Jesse. And Jared, I think, wisely not fighting over this. Yeah, I mean, why bother, right? Like, you have something that is going to win the game in very, very short order. Just pr make sure that stuff stays under control. Because, like, I mean, something could realistically happen with, like, an Aetherling or something. Worry about that. Jesse would just land and says go. Both players with a boatload of mana. Kraken comes across. And Jared passes the turn. All right, all right. Chase the draw for Jesse, attempts to resolve it. It's funny what he really needs a supreme verdict off of this Jace. Puts over a Temple of Enlightenment, an Elspeth, and another Jace. So he'll surely take the Elspeth, and then it'll be countered. But, man, we're just really seeing the power of Kiora here. Again, not insurmountable that Jesse can still win this game in, in the face of the Kiora emblem, but it does complicate matters quite a bit. Well, the problem is Jared's counterspells here, right? Like, if Jared counters this Elspeth, he's dead, dead on board. And I think Jared sees it. Well, it does appear that Jesse does have Doomblade and I believe Supreme Verdict left over at hand. Oh, he still has a Supreme Verdict. So I Verdict. think he's just trying to... Oh, he's got some time then. I think he's just trying to bleed some resources out of Jared fighting over things that Jared might not necessarily have to fight over. And there's a Supreme Verdict. So he gets a, uh, a small little bit of breathing room. Jesse, I really like him, the way that he set up that turn, trying to make Jared perhaps evaluate certain cards differently or whatever when he actually had the answer to the Krakens in hand the whole way. Yep. And here we are likely seeing the Muta Vault be uncontested. Oh, no, okay. So the Doomblade is going to take it down. So now Jared passes the turn, still dissolve in hand, and Kiora Emblem going, but Jesse keeping his head above water for the time being. Minus his chase again. Reveal syncopate, Temple of Enlightenment, and Dissolve. And Jared puts the Dissolve in a pile by itself. And now we're, we're trying to noodle through how much value does Syncopate have here as a counter spell, which is a lot of counting of each player's mana. Oh, right, because, I mean, it would be nice to be able to play that Scryland right now and just, you know, dig a little deeper. But he has to take the Dissolve. And Jesse takes the Dissolve and passes the turn back. Jared attacks with the Kraken. T Jesse takes the hit. How much of this have you been seeing at, uh, at tournaments? The this, Kraken emblem. Uh, I saw it in the hands of uh, Jeff Hoagland a few weeks ago in a losing effort against Esper. Just got outpaced. 
So this is not the first. This is not the first one of these emblems I've seen. Wow, you saw the the Kraken emblem lose. Yes. Interesting. And here we see yet another Kraken. That might be it. Oh is no! It? This is going to be big. This is huge. This was literally the out, right? We see an Aetherling here off the top, which Jared tries to dissolve. Jesse dissolves back. Now, of course, if Jared has a removal spell, like the Detention Sphere, then uh, he can probably just force through the damage. Much easier to do against Aetherling when you're attacking for chunks of nine. And another dissolve off the top for Jared. Wow. Touch the and sphere and a pretty, a pretty awesome game one. That's incredible. Jared Porter wins the first game. Looked, I mean, he looked like he was in a lot of trouble. We were talking around turns eight, nine, and ten about how ahead Jesse was in the game, but he floated out pretty badly. The spells he drew were reactive kill spells, and Jared was able to sneak it with Jace and, and Sphinx's Revelation and Kiora. Yeah, I know. I mean, that was crazy. Jesse had drawn nine extra cards from his Sphinx's Revelation before Jared drew any. But at the end of the day, I mean, Jesse wasn't expecting to go to a go to a Magic tournament and uh, and get hit with so much so much of the Kraken. But <laughs> here we are. So as we go to the sideboard here, I have Jesse's in front of me. He has an Archangel of Thrun, three Blood Baron of Viscopa, two Doom Blade, two Ultimate Price, a Fated Retribution, two Gainsay, a Negate, a Revoke Existence, and two Thought Seasons. I definitely like the two Thought Seasons coming in alongside sure. the Negate and the two Gainsays. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the additional removal spells. And uh, I don't know exactly how susceptible Jesse believes Jared is to Blood Baron. That's another question here, right? Because in some, in some respects, he has a lot of the same answers. <laughs> Detention Spears and, and uh, Supreme Verdicts and, you know, the, well, the same yeah, yeah. structure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, uh, Blood Baron usually gets some utility from being able to, to beat Detention Sphere and Azorius Charm. However, Jared has access to not only Supreme Verdicts like everybody else, he has a bunch of Kioras that stop Blood Baron much more effectively than most Blue White decks are capable of, not to mention also things like Celestial Flare and Permission of His Own. So it is very possible we'll see the Blood Baron stay on the sideboard, or if he brings any in, maybe just one. The most important thing are those Thought Seizes and uh, counter spells like Negate and Gainsay. It is possible that we see Revoke Existence come in. One Revoke Existence is a real nice little twist, a nice touch when you're dealing with somebody who has Detention Sphere for your Planeswalkers, and Elspeth as a threat. Yeah, the, the, really the, the interesting thing about this matchup from, from where I'm sitting, if I'm in Jesse's seat, is does he feel like that game was a fluke, basically? Or does he feel like Jared actually does have an edge going long in the matchup? And does Jesse need to take a more aggressive posture in the matchup with something like Blood Baron? So in uh, Jesse on the other hand, or sorry, Jared on the other hand, has access to Pithing Needle uh, as a potential desperation sort of thing. You know, it, it could stop the Aether Wing, but that could backfire. It could stop uh, Al Smith or a Jace, but that could backfire. I don't think he's gonna end up going that route. He does have Dispel and three Negates and a Gainsay for a whole lot of permission. And then he has a uh, Revoke Existence. I'm um, sorry, uh, yeah, it's actually, he has Glare of, of Heresy to be able to fight Elspeth, which is a, a better Revoke Existence. Yep. Uh, and he also has three copies of Bermaz in his sideboard, and this is another card I'm curious to see. You know, we've seen Archangel of Thune all over the place as part of sideboard conversion plans. We've actually seen Soldier of the Pantheon in some blue-white control lists to try to steal games against uh, other decks by going a little more aggressive. Bermaz does that as well. Now, Jesse, of course, you know, he's playing Esper, has no end of spot removal and sweepers and detention spheres. But the question is, how much of that stuff is really left in his deck in the post-board games? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's going to be looking to cut his Doom Blades first thing, and the last breath wouldn't even work if he kept it, you know? Now, it's possible he keeps some amount of Doom Blades, figuring he's going to have to hit Mutavault anyway. But realistically, there's not going to be a lot of spot removal there. His detention spheres will be overworked anyway, and, and he's, his Revoke existence is not a Glare of Heresy. So it is very possible that Brumaz is, uh, is actually a pretty big game. One of the nice features of Brumaz actually is that you can't have Zorius Charm it without losing a little bit of value. Mm -hmm. So uh, Brumaz was a card when I saw it in the preview, I, I anticipated its home and center would be in, mostly in control sideboards, at least for the time being, because the small beatdown decks have so many good options to play at three, whether it's Spear of Heliod or Banisher Priest or Ajani, that there's a lot of competition there. But as a control sideboard card, when you're looking to convert or potentially steal games against people who have removed all their creature removal, Bermaz is about as good as it gets for that kind of role. Yeah, I mean, 
it, it, it's really just a question of do you want Bramaz or Archangel of Thune, depending on if you're trying to duck under or go over the top. And, and Bramaz can actually do both, <laughs> potentially. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's also largely a question of do you need the blocker, right? Yeah. Because, like, uh, the Archangel of Thune, you can put all your weight on the Archangel and, and hope it can carry you a lot. Whereas Brahmaz, Brahmaz is the type of thing, if you lead Brahmaz into Kiora, that's a pretty potent opening. Yep. And perhaps Jared just wants to overload the number of detention sphere targets that Jesse has. Yeah, well, I mean, you already know they're playing 40 detention spheres. So, you know, you can't worry about that too much. You've got to just play into it and be like, well, you know what? They're going to run out of detention spheres, and my threats are going to be awesome. So Jared on the play, cited an elixir of mortality. Jesse has chosen to draw for game two. Wow, that's that's pretty pretty intense with uh, the amount of planeswalkers that draw cards that he that he has access to. See how it works out for him here. Jared plays Howl found untapped and passes the turn. And can you imagine if these band decks had access to Farseek? Oh yeah. Forget about it. Farseek into Kiora. Oh, forget about it. Farseek into Jace. Can I interest Oof. you in any of this? Oof. Just land drops by the players thus far. Yeah, we really have not seen all that much Bant since Farseek and Thragtusk rotated out. But Kiora does provide a powerful reason to consider going back. Jared just plays his fourth land at Mutabalt. Jesse with the Temple of Enlightenment. No fireworks yet. Nope. Both players are going to be in a much more controlling role now that each player has added so much, so many counter spells. There's going to be a little bit less of this tap out game because it's so easy to just tap out, get your spell countered, then the other guy drop a counter spell when your you, when your uh, shields are down, or drop a Planeswalker when your shields are down. Jesse plays Hollow Found untapped and passes the turn his fifth land. Jared with a Dispel off the top. That's pretty big. The, pros the prospect of dropping a, a Planeswalker and protecting it. But he wants to wait a little bit longer. Jesse going for a rev for two at the end of the turn. And Jared not going to fight over that. Interesting. I like that play. It's real tempting to just want to counter at any Sphinx they can do. But with how many land and how many bricks each of these players have in their decks, it's very likely that a one-mana counterspell is just going to end up being worth more than a random two cards. Especially when, when Jesse is likely to have to discard anyway some of the cards. See him try to resolve it. Jace Architect of Thought. It's in. Wow. Did he not use Gainsay on that? Yeah, Jared might be trying to fight the I'm trying to fight over specific cards type of game and not really worry too much about raw card advantage. Wow, because I would guess that Jace would be one of the most important cards to fight over, but but it's also not clear the exact contents of Jared's hand. So this is the opening that Jared needs to try to resolve something. We'll see what that's going to be. It's a Jace of his own. Just met with Gainsay. And Jared says, that's fine. Plays a Temple Garden untapped. And passes the turn back. Jared playing a very passive game. Yeah, it looks like he's got Gainsay and Dispel in his hand up, but just lets the Jace live. So Jesse minuses the Jace, looks at Island, Elspeth, Jace. And Jared puts the Elspeth by itself. Jesse deciding, you know, because he's going to have to discard the hand size if he takes the Jace pile. He goes with the Elspeth pile, diversify the types of attacks he has available to him. Jesse then plays a temple. And a lot of counter spells in hand, pretty firmly in control right now. Yeah, absolutely. Sneaking that uh, sneaking that Jason was was real big. I don't know if it's fair to qualify it as sneaking it in when Jared could have countered it, but 
Well, it, it, I mean, you have it's to... It's in play. It's, so. it's tough figuring out which things are, are important or not, and sometimes presenting a front where, no, this isn't the important battle. We're going to fight about something else can uh, increase the, the probability that somebody else doesn't realize that's the battle, that's the showdown. You know, like, was that the showdown? Yeah, I guess it was. So Jared trying to resolve a, uh, a Jace of his own, which was met by a dissolve from Jesse. And now Jesse with a pretty enormous resource advantage here. Takes up Jace and passes the turn, sitting on a handful of counters. Yeah, look at the size of that resource advantage. He's got plenty of cards in hand, lots of gas, tons of mana. Jace ticking up. Yeah, if you're Jesse, what all do you fight over at this point? I mean, obviously, Jace, uh, we're seeing him fight over now. What else? I mean, Els I mean, uh, do you fight over... I mean, you obviously fight over Aethling. Do you fight over Elspeth? Depends if he has a detention sphere. Kiora might be worth fighting over. I mean... With so many counters in hand, it seems like just... Continuing to generate this resource advantage is what Jesse wants to do, and he's going to do that. Minus his Jace. Flips over three lands, takes the pile with two. Which is kind of interesting, because if he ends up just having to discard anyway, was it better to have an extra land on the bottom of your deck in case, you know, times get tough and you need every turn you can get? Well, this might be the opening he needs to resolve, try to resolve Blood Baron. And I think that's what you're going to see here. Hmm, very aggressive, Rue. I like it. Um, no, it looks like Elspeth instead. Still very aggressive. And comically enough, Jared with a couple counter spells in hand, but they are Dispel and Gainsay. Yep. So, not the, not, the, not the right costume for this kind of party. No. Nope. You see an end of turn. Elixir here from Jared after Jesse resolves the Elspeth and takes her up. And Jerry definitely looked like he was trying to sculpt the game about, I'm going to try to resolve specific things and fight over specific things. You can tell he still has those counter spells in his hand, but this has gone disastrously for him as, as Jesse's just accumulated an enormous resource edge. Yeah, I think that that Jace, you gotta, it's, it's tough because that Jace has proven to be a source of so many of the cards that are uh, creating the advantage for Jesse and with Jace at the root of it. Um, now, the fortunate thing for Jared is, of course, that he, he won game one. So at the very least, we're going to three, and not with a lot of time left. Neither player particularly well suited to try to win a fast game. But as we saw here, I mean, Jesse has spent very little time taking over this game. So Jared's going to try a main phase revelations for four. And Jesse's happy to fight over that, too. As he takes an untap here, two Planeswalkers in play, a lot of, a lot of cards in hand. Minus is his Jace away for three more cards. And now he has Aetherling and no mana at the ready for Jared. Yep. The noose is tightening. So Jesse attacks with his tokens, takes up Elspeth, makes three more tokens, and now resolves the Lane with a lot of mana ready. Now, Jesse is starting to run a little short on counter magic, right? Oh, uh, but concession. it doesn't matter. That's the game. So Jerry going to concede there in the face of an uncontested Aetherling, conscious of the time on the clock. That clock that you see on the top of your screen, that's accurate. The players have a little bit of extra time in the feature match area. There is six minutes left on the clock in the round for every other match that's going on, but the it's now slightly under 12-minute count is accurate for this match as we go on to a third game. So even if Jared didn't bring in the Bermasses for that game, how do you feel about bringing them in for game three now with time an issue as well? Well, first of all, being on the play, I think, is a, is a big leg up for Bramaz because you can conceivably get a hit in before there's even, uh, you know, before uh, Supreme Verdict even has a chance to hit. But also, you can get Bramaz down before Dissolve is an option. So, uh, additionally, being able to just play Bramaz into two mana means that if your opponent taps out a Detention Sphere, you have free reign to drop a Jace or a Kiora. Yeah. 
It seems critical now with the so decks both decks being so counter spell dense. The first one that forces the other person to tap out on their own turn, that's a huge deal. Now, uh, one other factor, um, so many of the counter spells after sideboard are like, like look at, I mean, Jared, for instance, just for his own plan, he's boarding in a gainsay to spell and three negates. That's five counter spells that don't counter Brahma's. And on Jesse's side, now we'd, obviously he doesn't know what Jesse has, but I negate and two gainsays. That's more counter spells that don't counter Brahma's. And it's likely, and the cards that are being removed from the deck are likely cards that do answer it. The Doom Blades, the Ultimate Prices, and other spot removal oh, yeah. spells are the you know likely to be coming out. So I think I think if you're you're Jared here, you got to mix it up a little bit. Show him the right, give him the left. And uncontested Brumazes very quickly came over. Oh yeah, plus with only 10 minutes left in the round, that is a card that ensures you can actually get her done. Yeah. And time is an interesting feature of these control mirrors because it does incentivize some people if they feel like the other player can't win in time no matter what, to do some more aggressive, proactive sideboarding plans where it increases your odds of winning the game. Maybe if you actually played the game out to, your to its conclusion, you'd be at a disadvantage. But you can either win the game quickly or have a draw still because the other person can't capitalize on your inefficiencies. Right. Yeah, and it looks like Jared is actually doing some transformational stuff here. I mean, Jesse's been done shuffling, kind of hanging out. Jared shuffles, goes into the tank, comes out with, let me sideboard in three more cards. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Mm -hmm. I wonder which three cards they were. I mean, this is a good time as any for Bermaz, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is definitely... I mean, and honestly, it's just a good time to be king, you know? Yeah. It's good to be <laughs> king. So, Jared, with the option to play or draw, I don't want to say on the play because Jesse actually chose to draw in game two there, so I don't want to yeah, say I think with you, any certainty. I, I think you want to be on the play, though. I think that... I mean, I mean, who knows? Maybe it ended up working out for Jesse the card advantage, but I think that the tempo is, is going to be important enough that y you probably want to play. Jared keeps and, and Jesse quickly mulligans. Of course, I mean, that's only the Brumaz plan. If you're just sitting around neither player wanting to make a move, it does favor whoever's on the draw. Yeah. Plus, when one player has to take a mulligan, obviously, being on the draw suddenly starts looking a lot more appealing. The whole game feels like it's just fought over land drops to me. That's that's really the crux of what's going on here. Although both players have been playing pro pretty proactively to the board, it hasn't just been a counter spell fest. No, no, no. But both players have been playing a little slower because of the fear of counter spells, the respect that their opponent might have. What's interesting is, does Jesse not realize how many counter spells Jared Porter has access to because he didn't use them? Yeah, exactly. That, uh, I was about to make the exact same remark. It's just he he. Conceded with a lot of cards in his hand, you would assume that if he had counter spells, that they would have been used on Jace's or what have you, but Jared was holding it all back. So Jared is going to choose to play. And both players leading off with temples. Temple yeah. of Enlightenment into Temple of Plenty for Jared. Both, both players have access to all their colors. Total enlightenment. This could be shields down, and, and uh, this this might be Bermaz time if Jared brought it in and it's in hand. Oh wow! And here we go. It's Bermaz. About the time time to figure out if Jesse Hampton is uh, in a world of hurt or if he's got an answer. No wow. answer. Oh wow! No answer. Boom. Eighty-seven point five percent. <laughs> Incredible. Maz comes across, brings a buddy to the party. That's weird. So that can't be right. Or is that just because we know that he doesn't have a Supreme Verdict? Because a single Supreme Verdict could get Jesse back in this. Dissolve. Jesse goes digging for a Detention Sphere or a Supreme Verdict. And Jesse has Jace Architect with Thought. Not a terrible sideways answer to Bermaz. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty sideways answer. <laughs> and he's simply going to minus, finds Detention Sphere, Mutable, and Thought Seize. Jared quickly puts Detention Sphere by itself. 
Mets that if you're going to try to stop Brumaz, you're going to have to pay the price. Fatsi's muta ball is so juicy to give up, though. I know. Looks like he might not be able to resist. I mean, thoughts he's... Oh, okay. He does get away from it. So, Jared, a commanding position here. Will easily be able to remove the Jace with the King of Oreskes. And we're likely going to see... I mean, any other Planeswalker would be huge here, or just holding up counter magic. Temple of Enlightenment for Jared. And no follow-up play. Yeah, this might just be holding up a counterspell of some sort. I mean, you know that, that Jesse has a detention sphere. But if he has to tap out, that might open up the window for Jared to resolve something else. Definitely. Particularly that Sphinx's revelation in his hand that's starting to look kind of uh, kind of sweet and juicy. Detention Sphere finally answers the Ravaz for Jesse. And another temple. So. Wow, so Jesse chooses to keep. That tells you something. Jesse's going to have something good next turn. The tokens come across, knocking Jesse to 11. Here's Elspeth for Jared. This is big. So Jared continuing to press his board advantage. He's got Jesse down to 11, which isn't super low or anything. However, five Elspeth tokens means that even if Jesse can deal with the, 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 the Elspeth, he's under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Uh, there's a... Jesse plays his sixth land, a untapped Halifound, and plays an Elspeth of his own. see what kind of answer that Jared has. Oh, no. He didn't even use his Elspeth first. Oh, wow. So, yeah, the symmetrical effect there of, 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 of Detention Sphere there takes care of both the Elspeths. Jared in his rush there just dropped the Detention Sphere into play, but now uh, he's lost a, a big part of his advantage. But Ramaz is back. That was, that was huge. And now Blood Baron here for Jesse. Wow. Really well suited for this fight against Jared's board wow. of all white creatures. This is the impossible dream comeback here. My goodness, with that Elspeth off the table, Blood Baron is free to just, you know, to, to run amok. And don't underestimate how fast these Blood Barons can win the game either. Oh no. However, Jared, with a Sphinx's Revelation still in his bag of tricks. You're going to see a Revelations for four here on the main phase with Jesse Shields down. So Jared's still a favorite, but it looks like 60-40. Wow. Now that we've seen the cards he's drawn, we actually have Jesse as a small favorite. Interesting. Look how the percentages just shift around. <laughs> Chase oh. Architect of Thought from Jesse. Quickly minuses. Another Blood Baron, a Gainsay, and a Hallowed Fountain. Jared again quickly moving the Blood Baron by itself. It's interesting because that Gainsay could potentially counter a Sphinx's Revelation, which might be Jared's best chance of getting back in this. But Jesse thinks better of it and does go with the Blood Baron. Jesse just plays a land and sends it back. Another temple from Jared. And that Blood Baron is really challenging for him to answer. Absolutely. I mean, he needs Kiora, and yeah. he needs Kiora soon. Supreme Verdict also doing the trick, except that, unfortunately, paralyzing Brumaz, or killing Brumaz outright. Jesse takes up Jace. And he does keep his top card. A 
A bad sign. Attempts to resolve a second Blood Baron. We're starting to get into the territory where Jared needs to find another Elspeth or a Supreme Verdict. And with that resolving, Jesse's starting to swing the game around, sends his Blood Baron into the red zone. Jared cannot block it. All of his creatures are white. Chase for Jared. Minuses, finds Breeding Pool, Negate, and Elixir. And Jesse sends Negate by itself. Jared takes the two card pile. It is interesting that the Elixir actually does buy him another turn. But Jesse, I guess, has to feel pretty comfortable in his ab ability to, to win from here. Yep. Absolutely. And so he's not that worried about the additional turn. Yep. It's possible we are in turn zero right now. Yep, as the clock has hit zero, so. Well, that extra turn, super important yeah. if you're playing for the draw at this point. Yeah. Jesse minus is his Jace. Three counter spells, two syncopates and a dissolve. Yeah, and with that elixir on the table, Jesse is looking at being one damage short of winning in turns. Jesse takes the dissolve. I mean, he kind of just has to swing with both creatures here. Yep. And then he has to hope that his Sphinx's Revelation finds him uh, something to do damage, like another Elspeth, you know? It's looking real drawish. I guess a mutavault. A mutavault is is kind of at the heart of what he's trying to do here. Yeah. Although Jared's going to have a lot of a lot of blockers on the way back is part of the problem because of the yeah, mass. Yeah. He's going to need a lot of detention sphere type of stuff in order to to have a hope of busting through. Doomblade perhaps. Maybe Aetherling next turn. Aetherling next turn would be great. It's funny, Jesse has a command and control over the game, but not the time to finish. And in this short game, it, it felt like this was a place where Jared would be favored because of those copies of Vermaz, but oh uh, yeah, might just be one turn. Jesse might just be one turn short here. Jared now on turn two of unturned times. His Blood Baron is so powerful against Jared when he doesn't have his Kiora. Yeah, I mean, Blood Baron, in every matchup not involving Red Green, uh, Blood Baron is just, you know, real strong right now. Even even a, a deck like Mono Blue, which has historically not been the most vulnerable to Blood Baron, nowadays they rely a little more heavily on Detention Sphere and Blood Baron getting a, a little utility there. So Jared pluses his Jace and now attempts to resolve a second copy of Jace. Which he also pluses. And this is real tough too because this ensures that something like Mutavault is no longer an out. Yeah. We might be at a spot where it's Aetherling or no on this next turn. Yeah, Jared, I believe, wisely playing conservatively here. Can't win himself in time now that Jesse's gained all this life, but he can do his best to ensure the draw. Now, Jesse needs to save three mana for a Dissolve, or this is going to get dispelled. And it does. It does get dispelled. Which means Jesse needs to rip. Wow. It is an Elspeth. But that Jason play means it's the Elspeth is too little too late. You can see, you know, Jesse can feel it, you know, with just a, a little bit more time, he would have a pretty, pretty huge edge here, but. He needs to find, needs to be Aetherling. Blood Barons are going to come across here. And looks like. 
Jesse is just going to pass. Yeah, I mean, he, at this point he can't win, so he's just going to hold yeah. this all up, and it is yeah. a draw. Wow, so crazy Jared, game. Yeah, Jared Porter, Jesse Hampton, band control against expert control. They draw in time, and this will send both and players. Forth. This will send both players to the draw bracket where they are likely to be battling against more of the same as the tournament progresses. Yeah, yeah, but you, you can't be too disappointed. 401 is a fine start to the day, you know? No, it's certainly a good start, but, you know, the when you're playing dice like Esper or Bant or Blue White, the first draw often foreshadows potentially, yeah. if not more draws, then at least more matches that are going to go on for a very long time. Yeah, because it's not even just other control decks being slow. It's also just other players who play a very slow and deliberate methodical game. Yeah. But uh, often it syncs up with these control decks. I do think that Jesse's probably just celebrating getting a draw. I mean, he was disappointed, obviously, that it didn't end up converting to a win after he had control. But he had already lost that game. And so getting a draw at all is is a little bit of a victory. Yeah, Jared, Jared felt like, you know, he was... It certainly wasn't a lot because those Blood Barons are challenging for him to answer and what have you. But definitely felt like Jared was a pretty commanding lead resource-wise. Oh, yeah. And, and, and having the Elspeth ensuring that the, 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 the Blood Baron has to wait until the Elspeth is dealt with.